in what parts of the state, and uh, what aphid vectors are there as well. Um, Bob did all of the hard work, all of the, the laboratory work on this. Uh, I coordinated collecting the samples from different fields, and Chris did uh, the aphid collection work. He's gonna talk about the aphid work in a little bit. I'm just gonna show you a couple of slides about the viruses. Um, what we did beginning in 2015 is we went to a number of fields in Skagit County, Whatcom County, and in central Washington, three parts of the state where we grow a lot of blueberries. In each of those fields, we tried to sample the whole field. So we would walk down a row every 10 or 15 paces, we'd collect a leaf. Now we'd do another 10, 15 paces, get another leaf. When we had three leaves together, we put them in a little container, and then we went that way through the entire field, going every 10th row, every 15th row, depending on how big the field was. And we left these little tags here, different places in the field, so that if we got a positive result, we could go back to that spot. We could confirm that, yeah, those plants are infected. Um, so I'm gonna go through this by virus. So the first virus that we needed to look at was scorch, blueberry scorch virus. Uh, you guys know, those of you who are friends from BC are all too familiar with blueberry scorch virus. You know, we did not really know how much we were gonna find. Um, so we went, our four central Washington fields, we collected, up. Oh, volume's gone. Derek, can you hear me? All right, so we went to four fields in central Washington, we collected from all those fields, about 92 samples per field. We got nothing, there's no scorch in central Washington. That's the good news. Then the not so good news in Skagit County, uh, we went to initially just three fields, the fourth one was only added in 2016, and we found in two out of those three fields, we did get some scorch positives. About 7% of the samples that we got were positive for scorch. In Whatcom County, uh, we did more sampling for scorch. And to our surprise, we found that most of the fields that we looked at had some percentage of plants that were scorch positive in that first year of testing. Well, that was a pretty surprising result to us. And we didn't want to make too much of it last year because, you know, nobody likes to think you have scorch in your field. So we went to confirm it this year. And what we did was we took advantage of the fact that the way we sampled, we knew which areas of the field we had found the scorch positives. We went back to those areas of the same field and resampled. And that's in this second column here. And what you can see in Skagit County field one, um, you know, the first time we resampled it, 92 samples, we didn't get anything. We went back again and we found it. Um, similarly, uh, there was another field in Skagit County that we sampled for the first time. We did find it. This field here is the only one in which we initially found scorch, but we failed to recover it both times. Not sure exactly why that is, but in all of the Whatcom County fields that we looked at, Wherever we had found scorch in 2015, we found it again in 2016. So, you know, the bad news there is that we did confirm that we do have scorch at a low incidence. There's not a whole lot of infected plants, but it was present in almost all of the fields that we sampled. And we sampled in fields in a wide part of the valley in the eastern, eastern section, the western section. Uh, we sampled from some young fields. We sampled from some old fields. Um, it was quite varied, but we found scorch pretty commonly. So I think the chances are that if you don't have scorch in your field, your neighbor probably does, and there's aphids that move back and forth. So you should really consider that your field is um, subject to infection by scorch. Um, blueberry shock virus, we've known for a long time that we have shock endemic here in the state of Washington. One thing that was kind of interesting to me is that in central Washington, we only found one out of the four fields that had shock, and it was present at a pretty low incidence. Um, Skagit, on the other hand, was just teeming with shock. Um, it looked like, you know, we had from roughly 40% incidence to 98%. Uh, in some cases, the retesting in field three, we had 100% incidence of shock. 
Um, I think if you could have had 200% incidents, we could. Uh, in Whatcom County, uh, we did have uh, shock in almost all of the fields, but generally at a more variable incidence. Some of the fields had a lot of shock, some had only a little bit. And again, the results were pretty well confirmed in 2016 compared to uh, 2015. Well, it all sounds really depressing. Uh, so now we get to the cheery part. This is tomato ring spot. Um, those of you who are here this morning probably remember Alan Schreiber talking about the importance of exports for our market, right? And one of the places we'd really love to be able to export is South Korea. And one of the hurdles to exporting to South Korea is being able to show that we don't have tomato ring spot. And guess what? We don't have tomato ring spot. We're really happy to report this. Um, in 2015, we did identify three fields that we that had given us positives for tomato ring spot. So we went back to each of those fields and we resampled them pretty intensively, doing up to 138 samples. We did not recover any tomato ring spot from those. So there's our, our good news for there. Summary for the uh, virus part. We did have scorch present in the low percentage of fields in Whatcom and in two out of the four Skagit fields. Shock was virtually everywhere except for central Washington where it was only in one field and no tomato ring spot, hooray for that. Um, here's a slide from Bob. He was, has also been doing some work on other viruses as well as these three. Um, he did find blueberry fruit drop virus in one field in 2015 and he has a suspect second field that'll be retested in 2017. Um, he also did find blueberry mosaic virus in a small number of the samples, uh, which he says is not surprising since it can be found in many fields if you look for it. Um, and then as part of another project that is a larger APHIS funded project, he tested a subset of the samples that we had provided him with for other viruses and they, um, Basically, uh, everything was negative for that list. And of course, he reminds us to not bring in infected plants and make his life any more interesting than it already is. Um, that's about all I've got for the virus part of this. Chris, are you ready to talk about aphids? Okay, just a reminder, two for one, right? And we're gonna have a list in the back, right? Bob, and these will, uh, if you purchase one, we'll deliver them to my office and you can pick them up locally if, if that works for you. So, okay, let's switch gears slightly. Um, uh, so this was, I, while I helped sort of orchestrate a lot of this, this was done by uh, several people. Uh, Betsy Schacht is in the other room right now. She did a lot of the identification of, of, of the aphids. Andy Jensen, who helped confirm that. Uh, Don McMorrin down in uh, Skagit County. Colton, who's in the back of the room, he helped check traps weekly. Um, Charlie Gunderson down in Skagit County um, and myself. So we were just trying to get a better sense of aphid, aphid population dynamics. Two years ago, we did kind of a point in time sampling, looking at three key uh, time periods, bloom, harvest, and post-harvest. And this year, we, we sort of stepped that up a little bit. So um, we utilized a settling trap that was uh, utilized, that was used by Ramworth in the, in the early 2000s in British Columbia, a uh, very similar trap. This is a settling trap. So typically you pick up uh, winged aphids uh, during migration into a field. Um, but as you'll see, that's not uh, completely the, the case here. We monitored and checked traps weekly, March through mid-October. Um, and again, those were checked weekly. We had two fields in Skagit and three in Whatcom County, just simply because of resource uh, constraints. Um, and we uh, identified species, to a or identified uh, aphids to species were applicable, and that's still actually ongoing slightly. There's still some samples left. Okay, so this is the sand, these are the traps. Uh, they're placed, the, it's a pan trap, uh, coated in a specific yellow, uh, acts as an attractant, uh, placed with water. Um, and those are checked and dumped weekly they're pretty much in the upper canopy. Uh, so it represents what would typically land on a leaf. 
Okay, I'm just gonna jump in. So these are the mean aphids per trap. Um, first, we'll look at Skagit County, and I apologize, that's unbelievably dark on this screen. Um, but essentially, I'll make a, 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 a drawing of the curve. There's a peak by about late July. So we're looking around, you know, within the harvest window. In some cases, the, both of these fields are managed organically. Okay, so that, that is going to be one contrasting difference between that and the, the Whatcom County fields, which are not. Whatcom County, we had a much more even keel, but more bimodal, where we had a, a, an early, earlier season peak. And then once we really started getting into um, um, summertime, that, peak, that dropped down and, and sort of resurged uh, back in late August. Of course, looking at just the pure numbers is not enough. Um, oh, so here are the sort of the phenological development. Um, the, the peak really fell, you know, well after bloom. Um, and again, we're into mid to late May, that early peak. Now let's look at um, wingless versus winged. Uh, this is uh, an indication of winged, uh, presence of winged, a winged aphids. Again, they're typically migratory. That's not always the case. But the wingless is a potential indication of colonization, which uh, it, it, that spread within field would, would, would likely be a more likely occurrence. Again, we're going to look at uh, Skagit County. This is um, our wingless, uh, uh, pretty, and again, I apologize about the lighting on the screen uh, globally today and tomorrow, um, but uh, the, 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 the wingless portion of the population really showed up um, in, during the summertime. Now, uh, as far as the, the winged portion, the peak of that really occurred in mid to late July. Uh, and again, these are, are, are both, both fields are managed organically. Whereas we look at the, the wingless in Whatcom County, that peak occurred much earlier in the season. So that quote unquote colonization was occurring much earlier in the season. Um, and this goes counterintuitive to what has been done, uh, what has been reported previously in the region. And again, this is uh, our winged or, and uh, it follows that kind of bimodal path with a peak in um, mid uh, uh, May, and then again at the end of the uh, harvest window timeframe. And then I'm just gonna break down the species, and this is uh, where we are to date. Uh, this actually slightly changed from the Blueberry Commission uh, report uh, that was a couple months ago because we've added to that. but. The, the biggest thing here is uh, historically um, the, the, the species that most likely that were previously reported to dominate fall on the kind of the bottom left hand corner, um, but they did not appear to be the dominant species to date in Whatcom and Skagit County. Um, and again, this is combined across that. A lot of that has to do with uh, one, we're putting, uh, particularly in Walker County, we're putting blueberry plants in, in, in nooks and crannies of the county that are much more adjacent to mu much different uh, adjacent vegetation. Um, and particularly that, that Pemphigus species, uh, particularly uh, prefers uh, birch, alder trees, and, and one field really drove that number. Um, but I suspect that to slightly change uh, when, we, when we get done with things. Um, so again, this just is sort of, we're sort of seeing if things are different um, than what has been previously reported and we're seeing a little bit of that. Uh, but of course, we're not, we're not done with the, the identify, identification to species. So with that, I'm done. Tom, you wanna come up? If there's any questions, um, we can uh, try to clear the way for, for Chad. Yeah, yes. Uh, oh yeah, uh, we're kind of short on people yeah, right now, sorry. Yeah. I just had a, just had a question about your sampling. So you just did pan trapping, and then you got the alates and the, the other ones all in the pan traps. You didn't do any leaf evaluations. We're going to do supposedly that this year. Okay. Yeah, we we did uh, two years ago, which I haven't reported on. We actually used a vacuum backpack, which would pick up everything, um, and but that was point in time, right? So it did, wasn't as valuable as as a, as a pan traps. But we're, ho we're hoping to get funded this year to do both of those. Thank you. Um, you want to come up and take uh, Tom, on the, uh, boy, that's loud. 
on, on the um, scorch positives. Are you seeing the symptoms in those fields and are you alerting growers to manage that when you find it? Yeah, so um, in some of the fields, we did see symptoms, but in other fields, we haven't seen scorch symptoms on the plants that turn out to be positive. Um, so we let the growers know, you know, which, where the plants were in their field when they were discovered to be scorch positive. Um, so we've done that. One of the things you might have noticed was that we encountered some problems with reliability in the score test. You know, we, we had samples that we had to go back to a third time because we thought we would be able to confirm it and we didn't. Um, so one of the things we want to do this next year is we want to get a better handle on when is the right time to sample for scorch and what are the right leaves to use to scamp sample for scorch. So we're going to try and make that a more reliable test. Um, and I think that will make it a little clearer for us to be able to pinpoint, especially on some of these varieties that don't seem to show symptoms, but they're perfectly infective for other plants. Let's let, let's, one, two, uh, one. Well, let's thank these guys. Thank you very much. And Bob as well for working on this. Thanks. I think Chad has been taking a seminar on how to write positive titles for talks that people want to come to. So let's try this one. Blueberries that are slow to get blueberry shock virus and other promising blueberry selection. Uh, let's welcome Chad Finn from um, OSU, or from actually USD, and I, I associate you with too much with OSU, but USDA uh, ARS. Chad. Although it is a good day to be a beaver after that football game on Saturday. Eight years in coming since we beat the Ducks, so it's always good. So thank you.